My name is Viviane Rezende. I'm from the University of Brasilia. And the title of my, the paper I'll present here today is The Paradoxical Space, Global South Academia Between Subordination and Privilege. In a previous paper, I argue that due to the continuous effects of power structures from colonial knowledge, many Latin American researchers studying discourse analysis occupy subordinate spaces when it comes to the practice and production of international academic knowledge. This subordinate space is, however, paradoxical when we consider our position within our local contexts. Sitting in a university office chair, for example, allows us to exercise the significant symbolic power of an institution that has for a long time held a monopoly in terms of knowledge production, since the university is the institution that expresses in each westernized space the knowledge that modernity considers legitimate. As Latin American researchers, we then transit this paradoxical space, a space of subordination in the production of international academic knowledge, and a space of arrogance in the production of local knowledge. We are often white people occupying positions of power in racialized societies. And frequently we, we are middle class, which means that more often than not, we reproduce whether we mean to do or not, uh, whether we are conscious of it or not, the race and class logic of colonial power in our local contexts. Even as we simultaneously struggle to receive academic recognition abroad, struggling against coloniality of knowledge, uh, we criticize the coloniality from which we uh, ourselves benefit at home in a form of privilege. Today I will discuss this paradoxical space, focusing on the coloniality of being as it concerns inequality in the university setting specifically. I argue that a critical and reflexive understanding of this paradoxical space is necessary for us to find opportunities to subvert the system of power and knowledge by way of ethics. The core of my reflection is what does it mean to re-exist when one occupies a space of privilege? Brazil was a colony for over 300 years. As is widely known, although uttered only in whispers in Brazilian schools, the European invasion of the Latin American continent occurred by way of genocide. The land that was named Brazil used to be inhabited by millions of people, and the lack of precise information, place, uh, precise information about this uh, places the estimates of the extermination in a broad range between 25 and 95 percent of the native population here. Historians explain that this decimation was made possible by three factors. An epidemiological barrier, uh, the exploration of labor of these populations through slavery, and the upsurge of wars between the native people promoted by the colonizers. Contrary to what is, is taught in history class, historians now recognize that indigenous slavery lasted a very long period, all the, the way up to the 18th century. The massacre continued even after the Declaration of Independence. And between independence and the present day, Brazil's indigenous population continues to be under threat. And now even more compared to recent times in because we are suffering this authoritarian moment in our history now, as you all know. Uh, with bodies slaughtered and cultures whipped out, away goes languages and knowledge. We have lost ways of understanding that come from the ability to ask other questions, different questions. For Daniel Munduruku, 
for example, the culture concept can be synthesized as the human ability to search for creative answers to the questions we are come up with. For him, then, there are many cultures because there are many different answers. This is also what gets, what gets lost with epistemicide, precious answers and other questioning abilities. Brazil was also built over long centuries on the backs of enslaved Africans. Though it may be true that many forms of slavery have existed throughout history, European modernity invented a commercial system in which human beings become merchandise and their trade resulted in colossal profit. According to Kihano, the racialization of populations occurred in opposition to the modern European white man and, as Hill Collins states, with domination based on difference forming an essential underpinning for this entire system of thought. These concepts invariably imply relationships of superiority and inferiority, hierarchical bounds that mesh with political economies of race, gender, and class oppression. Race is an attribution of meaning upon bodies, linked to a historical process of domination. This attribution is imposed by whites on other groups and result in competitive advantages for whites. Race and racism as organizing principles of the accumulation of capital made way for control of labor and of knowledge production. This powerful discourse, which invents, classifies, and subjugates the other, dictated the colonial differences that would later develop into scientific racism. This effort by science to justify racism, which greatly influenced 19th century thought and also became influential in Brazil, supporting ideals of whitening the Brazilian population backed by eugenic European immigration in the beginning of the 20th century. Scientific racism also led to the non-recognition of the other as a cognizant subject, as a being that, that thinks and knows. What does this tragic and bloody ancestral exploitation and the persistent epistemic denial of 60% 60, 60 of the population can mean to a people? What mystifications and unspoken privileges lie hidden under the dust of coloniality and fill up our lungs at every breath? A very pervasive and powerful mystification is the discourse of racial democracy in Brazil that posits the racially mixed nature of the Brazilian population as an in indication of a cordial colonization in opposition to the glorifying discourse of the supposed cordiality of colonial relationships in Brazil. Recent findings show a uh, maternal genetic ancestry that is mostly African and indigenous, whereas paternal ancestry is 75% European in origin. Our miscegenation is indeed mostly the result of violence and rape. But the myth of racial democracy by de-racializing de society by way of the apologetics of miscegenation plays a relevant role in maintaining structural racism because in concealing racial inequalities, it keeps them out of the political debate. This discourse has been especially useful in rationalizing racial oppression, disguising racial difference under the cover of colossal social inequality in Brazil. Yet, socioeconomic indicators suggest severe disparities between racial groups in the country. For example, in Jardim Paulista, an elite neighborhood in Sao Paulo, in which only 8.52% of the population is Black, has a human development index at 95, whereas Jardim Angela located on the city outskirts has an HDI of 0.75. And in this neighborhood, 
more than 60% of the population is black. Life expectancy in Jardim Paulista is 24 years longer than in Jardim Angela, according to data published in 2019. Numbers like these explain why Sueli Carneiro believes that demo demographic surveys are central when it comes to recognizing the disadvantage suffered by the Black population, dismantling sacred ideas to our society about the lack of existence of a racial problem. In this way, simplifications that reduce uh, the racial issue to a social economic one can be seriously disputed. This is true, especially because poverty is not something that went wrong in modernity, but an integral element of it, which is why, in the words of Nascimento, it has race, sex, gender, age, and regionality, a consequence of the project of colonial power that points to a racist, classist, and privileged colonial elite that sees itself in opposition to a segregated population of the outskirts, one that the mass media represents as violent, rebellious, undisciplined, uneducated. It is also in these powerful modes of interpretation that enmeshes much of the discourses that oppose the attempts to mitigate oppression and correct history. Denying the existence of racism is an effective way of making sure racial issues are excluded from politics. As discourse analysts we know and reiterate with Lydia Schwartz and Louise Starling, that the most effective ideologies are like fixed ideas. They seem to have the power to superimpose itself in society and create reality. When we hear it often enough, we start to believe in this country where it is better to hear about something than to see it. The concept of place of speech became popular in Brazil through the work of philosopher Jamila Ribeiro. At a conference organized by the Center for Advanced Multidisciplinary Studies here at the University of Brasilia in 2018, Ribeiro argued that place of speech is defined by the shared experiences of a person as part of belonging to a social group. In other words, place of speech does not refer to individual experiences, but to the shared experiences of belonging to a given group. For Ribeiro, to discuss place of speech is to discuss concrete inequalities, because there are experiences which are actually lived experiences or potential ones that exist on the horizon of possibilities that are confined to specific social groups. Bernardino Costa and Grossfogel recall that place of speech is not characterized solely by one's geopolitical location within a modern colonial global system, but also by racial, class, gender, sex, and other hierarchies that manifest in the body. Take me, for example a white daughter of Brazil's tragic history and heiress of the assimilation of European populations from eugenic migrations in the early 20th century. These Germans and Italians come to Brazil to be a cheap labor, but came bearing the privilege of, the privilege of whiteness, which in a racist society like this was the trigger for them to, to prosper. This is a privilege enjoyed by all people racialized as white in this country. This is because, as Carneiro explains, racial discrimination acts as a break on equal competition, ensuring an advantage for white people, such as myself, and thereby reproducing the patterns of inequality. 
No white person in a racialized society such as this one is capable of giving up the privilege of whiteness. Indeed, speak of, speaking of bodies in motion, let us recall Quilomba, uh, who spoke of the ability that white bodies have to move freely as they are always in the place, in the unmarkedness of whiteness. In Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon tells us about the epidemization of inferiority, which Maldonado Torres rewrites as the coloniality of being. Uh, the primary reference of the lived experience of colonization and its impact on language. In this perspective, language is understood as that which defines humanity as a source of identity as self-understanding. In her discussion of Eliane Cavaleiro's research on childhood education, Sueli Carneiro also expresses concern regarding the suffering caused by, by racism, especially in the schooling of black children. I think of my own embodied experience as a white child and the situations that formed part of my childhood. And so they also make up my subjective constitution as well. It is clear we need to study the psychic effects of privilege on the subjectivity of people racialized as white, the symbolic and imaginary representations of the white body as an instrument of power and privileges. Sueli Carneiro therefore asks mm -hmm. herself, in terms of mental health, what does it mean to have an ego and a subjectivity inflated by the feeling of racial superiority? This is a question with which white Brazilians are rarely confronted because white racialization is naturalized. Therefore, the privileges are viewed as natural as well. Moreover, the powerful discourse of meritocracy disseminated in the media is always called forth to ease the conscience. Hence, whereas a black person could hardly live in, live in Brazil unaware of racist practices in everyday life, white privilege can pass as natural and never become a subject of thoughtful reflection throughout the life of a white person. Delia Gonzalez, upholds that the effectiveness of the ideological discourse is given by its internalization by part of the actors, both the beneficiaries and the afflicted. Race and class privileges are epidermized, as are the corresponding subjugations. It is imperative to always question the universal knowledge of whiteness, for although they act like universal starting points, they are also standpoints points. Given that epistemologies are actually ways of thinking about the world, we must perhaps pay more attention to how the impositions of our embodied experience, both concrete and available in the future, are an imposing and restricting place with regards to our abilities of being and knowing. Jamila Ribeiro also calls for an ethical stance. What is your responsibility as a privileged subject, she asks. This question has helped me to reflect on my place and how this place limits my horizon of possible understandings. Therefore, I have been asking myself, in what ways has being a white middle-class woman shaped my actions as a professor my abilities as an advisor and discourse analyst. To what extent do I carry the prejudice of my race or the arrogance of my class? How much of all of this do I allow to enter my classroom? To what extent am I able to resist and to change? How can I take action in a radical way to subvert the knowledge that imprisons me? Hadad Souza has helped me reflect. She tells me, 
action is a moment of convergence in which the social, political, psychological, emotional, spiritual dimensions of the self come together. It implies liberating ourselves from the institutional straitjacket that constricts human life and therefore experiences oppression or exploitation and as a cause of human suffering in certain contexts. The nature and the range of social transformation, as well as the type of social transformation that action can generate, depend on the nature of the research, but they also depend equally on the relationships and social experiences of the researcher as a human subject and to the extent to which she either identifies with the knowledge. When it comes to whiteness, what pieces of knowledge must we unidentify ourselves with? As Viveiros de Castro said, it's not only about answering the question with scientific arguments, but of making existential decisions. That is politics. An effective action of racial politics in the field of higher education is affirmative action, including admission quotas in universities. The inauguration of a system of racial quotas in federal universities in Brazil elicited a strong reaction from the bourgeois press. Despite having overcome the legal debate on the topic and having instituted public policies and norms, the resistance in universities still needs to assert itself on a daily basis. This introduces issues regarding the violence of silencing and to what extent the silencing is in fact broken when black bodies are present how much of the racist educational practices in elementary school education seen in the work of Carneiro and Gonzalez, for example, are also reproduced in university space, we should ask ourselves. With bell hooks, we have learned that pedagogical efforts should respect and honor social reality and the experience of non-white groups. And in order to do that, our teaching style has to change. Thus, as professors, we have the duty to confront the biases that have shaped educational practices in our societies. This means that the faculty must be aware of the racism that is so often hidden. As Munduruku would say, it involves putting the heart back where it belongs. And it is such a profound transformation that we need to find the courage to do, simultaneously facing the dermization of subordination and of privilege. For Rios and Lima, in the academic field, a greater number of black students, male and female, entering higher education institutions by way of affirmative action policies, has vigorated the race and gender debate. A new type of student began to occupy the seats and the scene at the universities, producing a much more socially and racially diverse student body. Research agendas are being redefined by the political unrest and by the trajectories of these black young people. Indeed, affirmative actions in university admissions uh, promoted a veritable revolution, not only in terms of the diversity of the people that enroll in academic courses every semester, but also in the tension provoked on academic research and extension programs with other points of view and new demands. We have all heard stories of students who, who are the first in their family to graduate from a federal university to be accepted into a master or, or a PhD program in Brazilian universities. With the passing years, this policy revealed its worth and is reaping the rewards, but discrimination still exists and many painful stories take place in the classrooms and hallways of our universities. The hidden chain of tension that affects learning about which Bell Hooks spoke continue to, continues to operate 
and to silence what implicit and explicit judgments regarding knowledge and modes of expression of these students, which mark their origins, work to warn them that they are strange bodies. What implicit and explicit judgments regarding knowledge and modes of expression of these study students, which mark their origins, work to warn them them that they are strange bodies. Are we sufficient, sufficiently aware of this? Is our heart in the proper place to feel and perceive in Munduruku terms? There can be no comfort while situations of discrimination and oppression are still noticeable in university spaces and in the practices surrounding this field. Many of our students suffer from depression and other psychological disorders, many of which were triggered or aggravated by their college experiences. Are we prepared to watch out for the sensitivity of these students? Have we allowed ourselves to become sufficiently tensed? How do we step down from our place of privilege? How can we re-exist being in this place? For Amina Mama, our ethics as academics is materialized as a function of our paradigms, that is, of the epistemological framework and of the methodologies that we employ. It is here that we exercise our capacity for professional action and our integrity, making choices that are not only technical or rational, but also moral and political. Bell Hooks tells us that many students refrain from asserting their subjectivity in, in the academic space to protect themselves. After intimately examining our memories, we should ask ourselves if we have been paying enough attention to these often silent conflicts. What strategies can we develop to listen to the silence? We have already said a lot about how the distribution of the discourse space, the possibilities of accounting for oneself, describes symbolic power in hierarchical relationships. With Van Dyck, we come to accept that the power over discourse, over word circulation, and over the dissipation of understandings and thoughts can be a form of abuse of power. The same author defends that this power uh, not be defined as the power of a person, but rather as the power of a social position, organized as an integral part of the power of an organization. For example, the, pow the power position of a professor in an, an university. What have we done with this power and how can we improve ourselves? Can we, as Freire might suggest, critically re-existentiate words. The educator talks about the importance of learning to say one's word. Emitting opinions could be considered the embryo of agency. Like one's voice, discursive space is conquered and becomes dynamic in academic practice, encompassing the classroom and other spaces of circulation action. For Oliveira and Kandal, the effort of recognition means deconstructing the myth of a racial democracy, adopting pedagogical strategies for valuing difference, reinforcing their anti-racist agenda, and questioning ethnic and racial relationships based on prejudice and discriminatory behavior. As we know, empowerment is an internal response to external extremity and not the opposite. Evidently, this does not attenuate the relevance and the responsibility of external stimuli, and that is where attention is being demanded. The internal movement of reaching awareness or of the awakening of diverse potentialities that will define the coping strategies for the practices of the system of domination, which defines empowerment, may gain momentum from encouraging expression in spaces with which we professors have power. 
This may be more revolutionary than any study on racism in the media, especially if both actions, the efforts to transform the university itself and the movement to understand the same problems in other areas, like, like the media, for example, go hand in hand. Affirmative action policies in university admissions here in Brazil have revolutionized these institutional spaces and triggered many repercussions in identities, discourses, and practices. They have caused a tension in teaching, research, and extension programs with new perspectives and demands. They have provoked external and internal shifts. They have shifted coloniality from our language. In an interview to Instituto Humanitas, Peter Sloterdijk defended the critical importance of changing the grammar of our behavior. For the philosopher, everything we do adheres to structure, much like a language. And action is something governed by hidden structures, like how the sentences we produce are ruled by grammar and by the lexicon. He's not a linguist. Uh, and he's talking about language uh, to trying to understand social structures. And, and he continued, I think we are still uncomfortable at the level of lexical change. We are now learning new terms, a new vocabulary, but little by little, we will also learn a new grammar. We can learn a new lexicon with some, some effort of reason. But for a new grammar, we need not only to learn, but to sentir pensar, not just razonar, but corazonar. In order to overcome the coloniality of being and thus re-exist in this historically given place of privilege we occupy at the university. Apprehending a new grammar in this context will mean changing the syntax of relationships in this discursive space re-existing in the gaps of the place of whiteness and of power is to decentralize oneself, to overcome one's own assumed centrality, which potentially promotes becoming. To dislocate oneself from the center is to make room for other identities, to strategically seek to place oneself on the margins. This is space of creativity where new discourses arise and we can learn other questions, maybe better questions. Thank you.